Hi, my name is Johanna Hellsten. I'm a Swedish artist and lecturer in fine art. Uh, I've been living here in the UK for over 23 years now. <laughs> and I'm currently working at London Metropolitan University in fine art. I used to work at Loughborough University until about half a year ago. I used, yeah, I played the recorder when I was little <laughs> and I was quite serious about it. Um, but I ended up in fine art in the end and have slowly since my uh, early 20s moved my way back to sound and music, I guess. And um, the really, I think the core of my practice is really sort of environmental sounds and voice and animal, but environmental I include often animal as part of environment. Um, and I'm really interested in how we voice things or how we understand things through voice. And that comes, I guess, from being a foreigner for a long time <laughs> where I live. There's always that kind of notion of being translated, even though I think in English and speak in English every single day, it's still a sense of being in translation every single day. So I'm really interested in that kind of mediated way of being in the world or that there's some always some sort of mediation or translation going on in how we understand everything and sound is very much part of that trying to understand how something sounds or how the animals are communicating or how we are communicating with each other and how you have to slow down or articulate differently or whatever so that's kind of at the core of my interest really is translation and um, that then takes its form in different ways. So, for example, the, you mentioned the sound score, so I was going to talk about that. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I did a performance piece or sound scores for a performance um, by choir that's called Rupture, one part of it, and the other one is called Flow. And they belong together and are related to um, the uh, volcano Hekla in Iceland, and the Icelandic composer John Leifs, who most people I don't think know who he is. <laughs> uh, he was a very interesting uh, 20th century um, composer in Iceland who was studied in Europe and then moved up back to Iceland and uh, created pieces of work that were very much influenced by the Icelandic nature and the sagas. And most of his work is very difficult to perform or demands a huge amount from the performance and includes a lot of strange uh, instruments or whatever, like anvils and chains and stuff. <laughs> uh, so I've been fascinated by his work for a long time since I was a teenager. And so I wanted to kind of do something which is inspired by that, but also by traditional sound scores and uh, like John Cage and Stockhausen and so on. Uh, but something that is moving and changing and requires the performers to translate in action rather than read the score and then kind of decide or rehearse, be able to rehearse it in advance. So the score is based on environmental recordings of uh, the volcano and the sounds around the volcano. It wasn't active at the time, but I have some other recordings of active volcanoes <laughs> and some of the animal sounds from around the area. And then I created a sound piece from that. And then I translated that uh, in various ways, both visually and uh, sonically into different scores two, two times. And then into the final score that is the rupture one, which is more of a visual kind of scores using the sound waves that we can see when we're editing sounds. You can see all these like waves that go up and down. Um, so using that. And then the sec, so that was performed in Iceland in 2014 by Hjolmeki Choir, which is a classical choir. And um, they are very much trained in classical singing. So found it quite interesting and challenging to perform it. And then in autumn last year, it got performed again by an anti-choir called Juxta Voices from Sheffield, who are very well versed in noise production. <laughs> and uh, 
they performed the score again and then together with that I created a new score that was a, in relation to the first one but using different different uh, translation processes and then into words um, and the words were kind of onomatopoeic uh, to what I could hear from the different scores that I made so it goes through all of these different processes um, and then they performed that both of them at Nottingham Contemporary in, in the autumn. Uh, it was quite an experience. <laughs> but yeah, so that's kind of encompasses both the envir environment and voice and the capacity of the voice or pushing at the point of capacity of translation and voice. just more that not not surprising as such but more that it became more way more complicated using language as a as a means of trying to do the sounds than a general instruction so for example saying for the first piece when i instructed the hjolmeki choir i told them what animals they were and so they had an idea but so then you can kind of in your head hear those things but in the second piece in the flow piece with the with the text kind of onomatopoeic things with using language um it's really difficult like you language isn't good enough <laughs> like it doesn't it doesn't do the job <laughs> so there's always like that really interesting slippage between like what you intend for it to do so even though i'm vocalizing it myself over and over and over again to try and get the right sounds it just always slips and doesn't become quite right um, so it's interesting how that then is picked up by them and interpreted in a different way um, sometimes it sounded quite similar to what i had in my head but most of the time it was not even close to what i had in my head <laughs> what it would sound like uh, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that that slippage. But that's what I'm interested in: is that is that kind of slippage? Oh, that's so. I have been really mulling this over. It's such a difficult question. It's like two different things I would really love to do. One is to continue with this Hecla thing, um, and to really finally. Um, be able to perform live on Hecla. <laughs> so go go to the volcano and actually perform there and do some more research around it and understand the kind of geothermal soundscape and um, what's going on and how that's impacting our environment at the moment. So and how animals react to those sounds. Uh, so that would be like one thing I would really like to, because that's always been part of that project, but, you know, it requires quite a lot of funding. Uh, I'm not giving up yet. <laughs> it might still happen. Uh, the other one is to resurrect a project that I worked on for a while, which I'm really keen on. And I think I will try and resurrect now, <laughs> is uh, a project around the nightingale floors that are to be found in Japan around the palaces and temples, which are these floors that make noises when you walk on them and supposedly sounded like nightingales when you walk on them. And I've done a, quite a lot of work and research around it in the first stages before, quite a few years ago, but I've never been able to actually find someone to help me build and work with me building things. So that would probably be the thing I would really like to push a little bit more on because I'm really interested in how we could use low impact, low, low kind of key constructions to create walkways or instruments for urban kind of uh, social housing estates and places or for visually impaired um, people where you could use thresholds and things to in to in indicate the change of space or place by the use of very minimal sounds but i don't really want digital i'm trying to add the sound but only through 
uh, natural means that would be sustainable for a long time. So nothing that would be needed to be maintained, you know, by electricity or electronic or wiring or whatever. So I'm still very keen on developing that project. But one book that I keep returning to and I get excited about is uh, Jean-Luc Nancy's book called Listening, which I have here, this one, um, which is very small uh, and inconspicuous, <laughs> but I find it really interesting in terms of uh, the pos possibility of, it talks about listening as a straining towards a possibility of understanding something and not understanding something as an object or as a self or a you or me as differences, but just in and of itself. So a straining towards a possibility. So I find that really interesting in terms of listening's potentiality. Um, and I guess in relation to that, I've been really enjoying reading Salome Vogelin's um, recent book that she published last year. Uh, the political possibility of sound, where she talks about similar issues. But I, I think like the otherwise, the person who I always enjoyed reading is Brandon Nobel. Um, I find all of his books really interesting. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I have, there's so many to choose between. <laughs> Kathy Lane has written so much about uh, women and boys. And I find that really interesting. Um, and yeah, so many shoes between. But if a film, I, want, I, I was wondering about a film, whether to suggest a film. And the film that I find really interesting is called Hookley or Hiccup. Um, and um, oh, I can't pronounce his name. Jorgi Pal. Palfi or something like that. I apologize in <laughs> straight away. Um, but it's a really, really interesting film. There's no dialogue in it. It's just environmental sounds and it's a sort of who's done it uh, film. But it's phenomenal for its soundscape and just really interesting to not have any dialogue whatsoever in it. <laughs> 